thanks everybody for joining after the the summer break. Uh, so it's nice to see people uh, coming back. Um, today uh, we have uh, Marina Norma, who's a, a PhD student in economics and, and public policy, uh, going on the job market this year. Um, going to present some of her uh, her work um, on um, in, on agricultural policy in India um, and 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 show uh, how how to use how she's uh, used a natural experiment methods to study a particularly a particular agricultural policy change uh, that that took place uh, in India around uh, 15 years ago and what we'll do is uh, feel free to ask questions throughout we'll also save a fair amount of time at the end for question and answer uh, session um, but, but feel free to jump right off uh, mute, ask your questions in, in a traditional seminar style. Um, so, uh, Marina, go ahead and uh, share the screen and uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you to the CGR for putting together this seminar. Um, I'm Marina Ngoma. I will be presenting this uh, project on agricultural development in and environmental quality in India. This is joint work with Kyle, Emerick, and Abel Kutangila, who are both in this room. Okay, so to give you a little bit about the motivation uh, of why we are uh, running this project. So, <clears throat> as we know, there have been many policies around the world to support agricultural production. And uh, this is this comes in many forms. Most of the times they have uh, input subsidies or other types of agricultural extension support. But it's not clear whether these types of policies are uh, first achieve the objective that they are often assigned, which is uh, most of the time just uh, meeting food security through increasing um, for the production of uh, certain crops. And we don't know whether these types of policy have any externalities on environment. So whether they have negative impacts on uh, environmental quality. So this project is about shedding light on this trade-off, uh, which is important for policy. So thinking about uh, large scale uh, agricultural programs and how they affect uh, the production as well as environmental quality. So this is uh, what we're doing in this project. To be more specific, we are, our research question is about uh, analyzing the causal effects of a large scale agricultural program on staple food production and environmental quality. So, this uh, large scale agricultural program, it's the national food security mission in India. It's a program that's been um, implemented across the country in India. I'll tell you more about the details on this program in a few slides. And what we do is we take advantage of the way the policy was implemented to estimate causal effect of uh, the program on environment in particular in looking at groundwater depletion and water quality. So as I just mentioned, we are trying to take advantage of the way the program was implemented, which is allowing us to implement a clear quasi-experimental method to come up with causal effect of this program. So what are we finding? We find that uh, the program did increase the production and cultivated area of uh, one specific crop that I'll tell you about. So we find a 56% increase in cultivated area and a 63% increase in production, which is uh, a huge impact. When it comes to the environmental um, outcomes, we don't find any effect on groundwater depletion. However, we document positive effect on surface water quality. So I'll tell you about the, 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 the outcomes we use with our dissolved oxygen, but specifically in the, a measure of whether the water is buffable. So we do find a positive effect on this uh, outcome. Okay, so where does this pro, pro, uh, project fit in the literature? We have uh, basically two main strains. The first one is on papers looking at agricultural policies and how they affect uh, agricultural production. There's been many, many uh, studies, but for example, we give a few examples here, which are uh, papers looking at, um, with a clear identification strategy, looking at um, 
the impact of high yield uh, uh, inv investment in high yield um, uh, crops and how they affect production and agricultural income. So this paper do uh, provide positive impact on production and other um, uh, outcomes at the agricultural level. So the second strand is on the relationship between agricultural activity and environment. So on this set of literature, most of the paper do use core, are correlational. So they don't uh, necessarily have a clear identification strategy which can provide causal estimates. So they mostly correlational, co correlational studies and the uh, evidence is also mixed. So some of them provide some positive impact on environmental uh, active, environmental outcomes, why others do provide uh, negative impact on environmental outcomes. So on this um, strand of the literature, there are little causal evidence studies, one in Uganda, which uh, shows positive impact on environmental outcomes, but it looks at deforestation. So what we do here is that we do provide some causal estimates on a large of a large scale program while looking at different sets of outcomes, which are water quality and groundwater depletion when it comes to environmental quality. And we do that in the context of India. I don't know if I should stop a little bit uh, for questions before I, I move to the design. Um, no, I, I think that uh, if people do have questions, so uh, they can either just uh, c come right off mute or, um... Or ask them directly. So uh, hopefully they'll they'll do that, and you can uh, keep keep going ahead. Okay, great. Okay, so a little more details about the program. This is the national food security mission in India. It's a nationwide government program. It's a, a pretty big program where the government is aiming to expand production in key grains, including rice, wheat, pulses, and coarse cereals. But we do focus on wheat for many reasons. One is just, it's one of the crops where we have a clear um, um, identification for our method to hold. And uh, the program is, meant to improve individual firm productivity as well, as well as increasing profitability for farmers. So they do this in many activities. Um, one is the demonstration of improved seed varieties and the other is the distribution of subsidized seeds. So these are the two key activities, but beyond that, they also provide subsidies for machinery, and there is also complementary uh, infrastructure projects such as irrigation facilities. So the, this program has some interesting um, uh, features which allows us to, to evaluate it in a, in a clear identification strategy. One is that it's uh, being implemented in five years plans. So it means the government will see it for every five years and define the criteria and also uh, lay everything about how they will implement the program and uh, what they are actually putting as a package for the program. So it started in 2007, but until 2012, there were not clear criteria of eligibility. So Starting in 2012, they have defined some criteria at the district level on, as to what uh, district can benefit from the program. So there are three main criteria. The first one is that uh, at the district level, so the, um, the, the area that is devoted to product to producing wheat should be more than 50,000 hectares. The second criteria is that uh, the yields, the yield yield, the wheat yield, which is production over area, should be below the average of the yield at the state level. And there is also a, a slightly different criteria in three states, which I'll, I'll show you more about. So this is what allows us to, to come up with a clear identification strategy so we can estimate the causal impact of this large scale program. So we take advantage of this targeting our criteria. So I just show you um, um, the illustration of how we implement this. So this is the map of India and the boundaries are the states. 
So the red boundaries are the NFSM program uh, states and uh, the black ones, however, the program has not been implemented. So we exclude the first uh, the three districts that have different criteria for inclusion in the program. So which leaves uh, which leaves us with uh, this other set of states about eight. So to give you an illustration at the district level, we see in red all the districts that fall uh, in this criteria that says that uh, the district should have a wheat yield below the average at the state level. So when we apply this uh, criteria, and just one key detail is that we be, we're using information from the agricultural year from 20, 2010 to 2011 to decide on um, the NFSM 2012. So every district in red are the district that satisfy this criteria. And then we go on to add the, the um, uh, criteria about cultivated area. So what is this is the set of districts we have left that also satisfied, satisfies the um, area criteria. So this is about 83 districts. And then what we do here, we do compare the district that satisfy the criteria and those that actually get treated, right? So we see that most of them overlap, which leads, leads us to, to conclude that our first stage is, is, is holding, right? Because to, to run this um, um, method, we want to be sure that the criteria are a good predictors of the actual treatment. So in this graph, we show on the X axis, the um, cultivated wheat area, which we restrict to our boundary from 10,000 to 90,000. So this is all uh, district around 50,000 cutoff. And the white axis is showing whether the probability that the district is treated. Each point is a bin of uh, districts that fall on each of the, the combinations. So this graph is showing us that there is actually a very strong first stage, which is uh, which means that the criteria actually predicts the actual treatment. So this is the first pass for us to use this method. What data are we using to respond to answer this research question? We gather five data sets. So the first is the data on the district that were included in the NFSM, uh, which allowed us to, to just uh, do the exercise I showed you. The second data set is the district panel of the district level agricultural area and production of wheat and other crops from the Indian Department of Agricultural Corporation and Farmers. And uh, we also have data, a set of data set for measuring our environmental quality outcomes. So the first is the data on surface water quality, which comes at the station level, monitoring station level. And then we also have data on groundwater depletion, which comes at the wealth level. So we have about 60,000 stations and about 30,000 uh, groundwater wells um, in our initial data sets. And then we also compile data from the National Sample Survey, the NSS, to, to see the characteristics of uh, households across the district. So our empirical framework, um, <clears throat> we are running this as our main regression equation, where Y is the outcome at uh, the district level for year T. So beta one above 50,000 D, so above 50,000 is the dummy variable, which tells us whether the district is above or below the 50,000 cutoff in year 2010. We have uh, our running variable, which is area. So we are focusing here on area as the running variable. And we include the interaction between the dummy and our running variable to account for the differential um, slope around the threshold. 
We also include a set of controls, which also include the household uh, social demographic characteristics. We also have the year and state dummies. So we focus on beta one is uh, the, the impact of our program. So it's the intention to treat effect of the NFSM program at the district level. We cluster the standard errors at the district level. Okay, so we have some, uh, just to tell you about what sample we're using to run the regressions. Uh, first of all, we do include the district word with yield is below the state average. So this is how we account for the second uh, eligibility criteria. We also exclude the district that fall into the, the three states. So, but here what we do is we only exclude the district that have less than 50,000 hectare because that's what the criteria that, that was stated in the, in the program across these three states. And we run the analysis for the, period, the five years program from 2012 to 2017. Our bandwidth is 40,000 around the cutoff of 50,000. So which leaves us on the interval of 10,000 to 90,000 hectares of wheat production, wheat cultivated area. Okay, so what's the identification assumption? So for our beta one, to estimate the causal effect of the program. We first want the first stage to hold, but we also want to uh, have uh, eligible and non-eligible district to be similar near the threshold. So basically what we do to test for this assumption is to compare the district that are right below and those that are right above the threshold and make sure that they're comparable on at least on observable characteristics. So we do that within our bandwidth and we don't find any evidence of this continuous jump in most characteristics. So this is, um, I think I'll just show you the table first. Um, this is how we implement it. Um, in this table, we show the summary statistics of uh, most of the variables we use. The column N is the number of observations. On the second column, we report the mean of the control districts. So the district that do not uh, satisfy the, the criteria on area. And then we have uh, the difference between the control and treatment. So what we see here across our agricultural outcomes, environmental outcomes, and the household characteristics, we don't see on average that um, the treated group and the control group are, are significant. We have one slight difference here in the household size, but we do control for most of the, the regressions for household characteristics. So <clears throat> how do we uh, measure our main outcomes? So as we mentioned, we're looking at agricultural outcomes as well as uh, environmental outcomes. So for our agricultural outcomes, we look at the wheat production, and then we also look at the wheat cultivated area. And the environmental outcomes, we have two main uh, sets of outcomes. The first is on water quality, which is the surface water quality, because there are many other layers, we we'll focus on the surface water quality where we use the dissolved oxygen, which is that just the oxygen uh, that we find in water. We also have biochemical oxygen demand. And on top of these measures, we also define what we call the buffable water. So this is a measure for whether uh, waters are buffable. So we do this by uh, following Shapiro in combining these three um, measures of water quality and defining that the dissolved oxygen, it should be above 64% saturation. The fecal coliform should be uh, below 1000 MPN per 100 milliliter. And the biochemical oxygen, oxygen demand should be below 2.4 milligram per liter. So when a district satisfies these criteria, they are they are assigned a dummy uh, one to be that they are buffable. 
and the water above above. Sorry, the, at the station level, not the district level. So we also have measures of water depletion, which is the depth to groundwater right before the monsoon, the monsoon season, which is the season where wheat is grown. Okay, so now I will walk you through the results. Um, our first result is that uh, this uh, program led to 56% more increased area and 63% more production of wheat compared to the absence of the program. Okay, so this first uh, result is focusing on area. We look at the log of um, wheat production area. The x axis is still the 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 cultivated wheat area around the threshold of fifty thousand, and then the y is log area. So this graph is showing up a a, a jump in log area when we compare the district that fall below the threshold and those that fall above the threshold. Same for the production, we see a jump here when we compare the district that fall below the threshold and those that are above the threshold. So in, uh, in terms of estimates, this gives us the, this table where we have on column two and three, the estimates of the program um, running this uh, RDD approach. So the first step, column is looking at, is showing us the estimate of the first stage that I showed you earlier. It's a, a pretty strong first stage and our coefficients are also strong, statistically and significantly uh, significant. So I will show you another uh, set of results. So here, what we do, um, we try to, to make sure that these results are robust. And also <clears throat> what we do, we compare, we run the same estimate in looking at the placebo district. So the placebo district are the, um, so we look at the placebo effect in the control district, the district where state mean yields are la la larger than the, where the, the yield are larger than the state's average. So this is what we should have expected that the program should not have any impact on the control district. So this is the evidence that we provide to support that. We don't see any impact here. We have a, a very small difference, which is uh, not statistically significant. So this is the table that corresponds to, to this uh, placebo effect tests where we don't, we report that there is no impact on the, 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 the the district that are above state yield. Okay. So I will move to the impact on environmental outcomes. The first one is water quality. <clears throat> we do find that the program has improved water quality. So this is the graph to, to show you an illustration of one of the measures, which, which is dissolved oxygen. This uh, graph is uh, plotting the same as the other graph. So we, we do see a huge jump here in um, this measure of dissolved oxygen around the threshold. And the corresponding table is this one, where we see that jump to be 0.9. And then we don't find any uh, detectable impact on bio biochemical oxygen demand while our dummy of water, whether the water is buffable or not has a significant impact. So this allows us to say that the program has a positive impact on surface water quality. We also show uh, that there is no effect in placebo districts. So again, to uh, provide evidence that uh, the effect that we're finding are more likely causal. We further look at another measure of of environmental quality, which is the groundwater depletion. We don't see any impacts on groundwater depletion. So meaning that 
where the district the district where the, pro the program is being implemented do not suffer from depleting water is measured by the death of um, the water in the wells pre monsoon so we don't see a huge jump so in terms of the sign this is a uh, negative but it's not statistically significant as we have uh, really districts all around the 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 place both below and above the threshold marina yes Guy has typed a question in the chat, um, uh, which is, uh, Guy, do you want to come right, come off and, and, and read that or you want me to? I can, either, either way. I think I could pro probably, probably do it then. It's just, what are the characteristics of the program that may lead to an improvement in water quality? Um, that, that's a great question. I'll just, come to it in a few slides, if you don't mind. Um, yep, coming up. OK. OK, so just to conclude on the water depletion, we don't find any evidence of, of, of a decline. So the, the, the coefficients are, are negative, at least when we do control for the, um, so these two columns have to up our including or not the controls. So when we include the controls, which are basically the household characteristics and the program outcomes, we do reduce the standard errors, but still we are not able to say confidently that the, the, the water quality, in, sorry, the water depletion did improve. So we, we are not able to conclude on this. So there is no evidence on uh, groundwater depletion. Okay, so to the question that was just asked, so this is where our project, we are working more into trying to understand what may drive this positive impact that we find on, on water quality specifically. So we did try to, to rule out at least one uh, channel, which is we asked whether this program is um, kind of uh, leading to a substitution away from more polluting crops, which could potentially explain why the districts that are increasing their production in wheat would benefit from better water quality, but we don't find evidence on this uh, specific channel. So on that but one, the, <laughs> on that one, the idea of more polluting, I think is a little bit, uh, I don't know, we might want to clear that up. Like what exactly is it using more fertilizer crops that are more fertilizer intensive? What is the, the precise definition of more polluting? I guess might, might be useful to clear that up. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and the way I see it is it's probably crops that are more fertilizer intensive versus crops that are less fertilizer intensive. Mm -hmm. um, and if farmers grow wheat instead of something that uh, is is more fertilizer intensive, then it could explain that and thinking about like runoff from yeah. agricultural cultivation. But yeah. uh, so far, we haven't found any evidence that that seems to be going on. Yeah, exactly. So, so there could still be other potential explanation. For example, whether the program, since it's uh, also having these fertilizer components, whether the fertilizer that they're providing are more environmental friendly or whether they are also, the program is also investing in some types of water saving technologies. So this is where we also- Sorry, let's, I think there was one more question. Did I see a okay. question? Was there a question there? Uh, I thought I saw a raised hand a moment ago. Yes, well, that, that's that's me. I went up and down. Um, there oh, okay. is a lot Sorry. here. Well, no, I just want to jump. I think those I understand that that's in progress, but I think that's really what is key to to understand, because so, so far what I'm hearing is that you look at the impact of those policies, uh, of those program really on me on mice and and looking at the impact on on mice and on also the trade off with different outcomes. Uh, 
but but whatever we'll see in terms of outcomes won't depend only on the on the mice crop that that will change the cropping patterns that will change the yes the basket of the different crops in the district and i think that's where the impacts or or significant or not but that's where the potential impact are, are coming from so i think that's really interesting to un to understand that that part of the story too to have the pathways in the yes in the causal impact thank you yeah, yeah I, think... I mean go ahead sorry go ahead marina no i, I was just saying that i, I agree with uh the, this comment exactly that's um one place we think we can just try to dig more and get a better sense of uh, what are the other crops that are being cultivated across the districts beyond the ones that we already tried to check. <laughs> I guess one thing that also comes to mind on that is one, one thought we had was that the fertilizer runoff and runoff is more severe in the rainy season, uh, the Karif season, um, and maybe this program was leading to a shift in cultivation away from Karif and towards Rabi, because wheat is a Rabi crop, uh, a dry season crop where it's not you know, raining all the time. So the runoff, I think, is, is perhaps less. Um, and so that was a, a testable hypothesis that we had. Uh, but you know, uh, from, from the first, first cut of the data, we, you know, we're not necessarily finding any clear evidence that's going on. Um, um, I mean, we're still trying to figure that out. But uh, we do so certainly that that seems like the the key candidate mechanism at least. Um, so so it's definitely point well taken. So actually, that this was the <clears throat> the pretty much the end of the talk. Uh, so just to conclude here. We evaluate the impact of a nationwide agricultural program on agricultural production and environment quality. We are exploiting an exogenous variation generated by the eligibility criteria of the program for inclusion in this NFSM program. So we are then using this uh, regression discontinuity design and compare the districts that are just above and those that are just below the cutoff what we find is that uh, the program led to an increase in cultivated area uh, by about 60, 56%, and also an increase in production by about 63% compared to the absence of the program. We do not find any evidence on the trade-off between the program and water depletion, but we do find a positive impact on water quality is measured by buffable water as well as um, uh, bio oxygen demand, dissolved oxygen, sorry. So we are thinking about uh, unpacking the mechanisms for uh, what is really driving this positive impact on water quality. So we would welcome any other comments and questions. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Marina. Um, so now, uh, uh, question and answer period. Um, and uh, starting, uh, I guess, uh, if you if you want to just jump right off mute, but uh, Vijesh, uh, you have, have a question there in the chat. Um, Yeah, I was wondering whether uh, there is any evidence of reduction of area under other crops or uh, whether more area was brought under from fallow or this could have different implications on the environment, right? Could you please say that again? I think my volume. No, um, you have indicated that there is a huge increase in the wheat area in this, um, in this inter intervention areas. And mm -hmm. this area is bought under from fallow land or from other other crops. And if there is any evidence that other crop area, like um, for example, millets or uh, oil seeds crop, the area has come down in this area and this uh, districts. I see. I see. So we so in this um, 
project at least so far, we are focusing on wheat. We did look at rice at some point. Um, I think if I can remember correctly, maybe Kai could also jump in. We were also finding, I think, a positive impact on rice, but uh, we decided to focus on wheat since we had a clearer uh, identification from the wheat. Um, but it's still important to, to really think about the other crops, especially as it also feeds in us to uh, trying to understand the the water quality results. So what we also try to do, I think at some point when we, we say that we ruled out the substitution is we look broadly on the cultivated area for pulses, right, and rice, but we didn't, we were not able to conclude that the program had uh, say a negative impact on production of rice and pulses. So, uh, could you also check whether there's an impact on the fallow lunch? Impact on, please. Fallow. Fallow, 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 fallow land. Um, okay. Yeah, that would be one direct way. Uh, I mean, we've looked at a bunch of different crops, and um, if there's no negative effects on the other possible crops, then it would presumably be coming from taking fallow land out of production. I don't remember if in the data we have, we have a direct measure of the amount of land that was being fallowed to use that as an outcome variable. Mm -hmm. But we can certainly, we can certainly check. Um, yeah. Excellent. Uh, and Nils. Just to follow up to that and to, ex oh, sorry. So sorry, maybe there was a bit of a uh, hang up there with Nils' microphone. Um, Nils, are you still there? Now I'm there. Is okay. it better now? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Just just to follow up on this question, why why is, this has been raised by several in these areas you've selected, wheat is the dominant rabbi crop, and so having a fifty six percent increase in area. Seems really difficult to imagine if it is already 70% or 60% uh, in normal cropping patterns in Punjab and Haryana and these places, Western UP. So finding out about this changes in cropping pattern for people from with a sort of uh, expectation of that area would be really important to make these changes credible. Uh, yeah. Um, I. I have another technical question. Um, you, in your letter description, you say you selected only those just above and just down, just below, just above and just below the threshold. In your regressions, it wasn't clear how you defined this bandwidth around the threshold. We only saw sort of a, a, a total area. So do, do, were you referring only to your comparison or actually to the regression that you reduced the sample to only sort of like 10% above or below. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, I will go back. Uh... Okay, so I think what it means is that in our data, we have, for example, areas with uh, surface cultivated wheat. We have district with cultivated wheat area of say, uh, 5,000. So those are excluded from the regression because we focus from the analysis because we focus on district that are around 40,000 of the cutoff. So it means any district that fall below uh, 10,000 hectares of um, cultivated wheat area or above 90,000 hectares of cultivated area are not part of our analysis. And that is still quite a wide bandwidth. How did you determine this bandwidth that this would be sufficiently narrow to have relevant results? It seems generous. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. I think um, the might maybe there's no formula to coming up with the uh, say specific bandwidth, but maybe what we should do is to to run to run robustness checks 
and change the bandwidth, try to use this a smaller bandwidth. Actually, the smaller the bandwidth, the the better um, we do in terms of um, identification. So we can try to run robustness checks using different bandwidths. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, there are certainly there are certainly bandwidth selection algorithms out there uh, to get deep into the the, the weeds. Um, and some of the Catmeo uh, et al. RD uh, packages that, that exist in state are, are, are quite useful for that because there's clearly a bias efficiency uh, trade-off. Um, you know, we selected, we, we definitely wanted to throw out less than 10,000 because if you get into the places with zero weed area, that really is, those, those places are so far uh, off, um, it really messes with that function. Um, and, and we found that actually, if you include those, then the, the points further from the threshold uh, change that regression function. Um, but, you know, the, the exercise of like looping over different possible bandwidths and showing that um, that doesn't really change the results is something that uh, uh, we can include here. Uh, I, I think we've certainly done it for the wheat, um, for the wheat area. Um, there's, there's definitely an efficiency trade-off because you're including fewer observations uh, when you when you narrow down that that bandwidth. Uh, but um, but the, the eyeballs on that um, uh, the eyeball test on that that one RD graph, I'm uh, I'm fairly confident with that. Uh, but that can of course, of course sometimes fail. Um, and so the, the first question, Nils, I, I I'm not sure if we if Marina got to the first question. The first question was on. No, it, it was just an explanation. It wasn't even okay. really a question. Just sort of a strengthening the argument that looking at cropping patterns is is really important. Where you have these huge increases in wheat area, because oh yes, and uh, there was another suggestion because you, I agree, fallow land is often not reported. You could just look at total a uh, change in total cultivated area, and see yeah. whether a cultivated area expands or whether it is just the replacement or substitution of other crops. That that would should be fairly easy. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, one thought on that is these are these, you know, this part of India is certainly the, the wheat producing part of the, the country. That being said, our estimation is local in places that are near that 50,000 threshold. And so 50,000 is not terribly far to the right of the distribution. There are places that produce a lot more wheat than that. And so the estimate is local in that threshold. Um, so even though it's a big percentage effect, in terms of aggregate wheat, it's 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 not like um, it's not like a fifty percent increase in the most wheat producing places in Haryana, for instance, because those are not even in the <laughs> yeah, bandwidth, yeah. right? Yeah, those yeah, are nowhere yeah. in the bandwidth. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, uh, Marie Charlotte, go ahead. Yes, well, I, I had several comments just just to to jump on what you were just discussing. I think that would be useful. Uh, to get an idea of the values uh, when we talk about the the impact on the on the areas, um, because as as you were saying, I mean those are or district with relatively low areas at the beginning. So even if we are talking about a fifty percent increase, that may actually mean quite not quite a lot, which may explain also that you're not necessarily looking seeing any impact on the on the groundwater, for example. So that's one point. Um, okay, I also wanted to come back on your identification strategy in the in the RDD. Um, if I understand well, there are actually two criteria for the treatment assignment. And what you're doing is that you use one criteria as an exclusion inclu inclusion criteria, um, the one with the yield, and then you use the other criteria, the area above below the fifty uh, key threshold. Uh, for your ADD identification. So my question is, I, why do you make this choice between the two criteria? What if you reverse the choice, um, use the yield uh, for the ARDD uh, and the area as exclusion, um, exclusion inclusion uh, criteria? Does that make any difference on the, on the result? I think that would be interesting to check. And, and is there any other way to do that? Can, can't you combine the two criteria into somehow one, um, yes, one inclusive indicator and use that into your RDD identification? And what are the implications on the, um, yes, on, on, on the result and how you interpret the result? 
uh, that's another one. Okay, last one is on groundwater. I was wondering how you measure groundwater at the district level. Uh, and, and again, uh, I've been done some work on that. I'm not so surprised that you don't see any result at the district level. It's just too big uh, to really see any, anything. So what, what else can you do on that? And, um, and also, do you use a lag effect uh, to look at the, at the impact on the groundwater depletion? That's all. Thanks. Okay, Marina, do you remember all that? <laughs> if, if, sure. not, if not, I think Marina, I miss... Cheryl, please circle <laughs> if back. If not, here. I'll be back. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So the first one is a great point on whether we could. So what we would find if we switch um, the the variable we use is a running variable. Yeah. So we we um, did think about that and. We decided to to use area as the running variable and still include uh, the yields and the sample because that's where we had a stronger first stage, and we still account for the other two criteria um, in our sample. So I can't remember. At some point, we did try to include the the yields, but. Yeah, I think we can just uh, make sure we include all these uh, the results when we 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 use yield instead of area as a running variable and and see what we get as result. Yeah. So, so that was the, yield, the, first the first stage wasn't really quite as strong with yeah. uh, the state yield. It, 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 there's still separation there, but separation right near the boundary was was less, uh, yeah. if that makes any sense. Um, and so. Um, that's kind of why we uh, arrived at uh, area instead mm -hmm. of yield. Um, I guess the the placebo exercise kind of uses uses both, and looking at the differences in, in discontinuity uh, or, uh, for the places above and below the the state uh, uh, yield, but mm -hmm. it, it certainly doesn't do the the RD with the yield variable. Um, one thought that we had on that was that it's also just it's kind of how do you say it's you know slightly less observable and, and kind of easier to manipulate like you know below or above above state average versus a direct observation of um, you know area but uh, mm -hmm. we could definitely uh, do that uh, ne next one Marina what was the yeah I guess <clears throat> I missed one before but I talk about the <clears throat> groundwater so actually we run the the regressions for groundwater depletion at the wells level. So we're using wells, uh, our unit of observation, of course, around in, in our bandwidth. So these are the only wells that we include. And uh, we we were able to match uh, the locations to the district. And we we have clustered our standard errors at the district level. But the regression is, is run at the ground at, at the well level. I guess, is there something we could do about that? I guess though, Marina, is that also the question? Hmm. Um, with the well level data, I mean, one thing we could do is is intersect the location of those wells with like wheat suitable area, if you will, um, some predetermined suitability measure for wheat in the district and look separately at the wells that are in the, uh, uh, the, the best candidate areas for wheat using the lats and longs of those wells. Yeah. That's, I think that's doable with the data. Yeah. yeah. You may, you may in principle also be able to have the areas under wheat at the block level, which is the, mm -hmm. yes, the, the below administrative unit after, after the district. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But not quite sure about your, about your treatment at the, at the block level. So, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be at the district level for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and if you don't mind, um, would you please repeat the, the lag effect? I, I don't think I got that question. The um, lag. What was it? No, it was simply that the, the effect on groundwater may not only be on, on this. So you're, you're taking the pre, <coughs> the pre, the pre-monsoon level, if I'm getting that right, 
Mm-hmm. And, what, and what I'm saying is that you may have a lag effect uh, between between your treatment and, and what you would see on the groundwater level. So not uh-huh. only looking at the, at the following years, but possibly uh, two or three years after. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that's something we could, we could test. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Thanks definitely. for all your responses. Yeah, the, the, t- the data go from, you know, several years pro- post-program and whatever was yeah. shown was just kind of the average. So we could plot out that kind of RD effect over time after. Mm-hmm. Cool. Thanks, Nils. Oh, maybe that was an yes. old hand. Oh, yes. there you are. There you are. Okay. No, no. Uh, just, yeah, also to, again, to reinforce that, because, I mean, the water effects are really complex because it depends on the changing cropping pattern. It changes, depends on the technologies used and Often wheat is quite sensitive to the irrigation practices. So very old fashioned flood water often has a yield uh, d- decreasing if, if effect with, because in most parts of the, fi- of the field, there is an over irrigation. So actually improved irrigation technologies use, use less water and sh- should have a positive effect. So taking that apart might actually, actually be quite, quite challenging. Again, I have another point also on your, um, the, the results you, the way you presented them, uh, these discontinuity graphs were very uh, uh, nice to, to, to watch. However, the, your interpretation sort of identified which ones were significant and which jumps were not. Would it be possible to have some sort of confidence bands around your central lines so that the audience can also follow your idea of what might be significant and what not? Because with these clouds of points, it is not so easy to, to see what would actually be an effect and what would not be. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, we can add uh, a confidence interval uh, area around the, the lines. Yeah. Thank you. We can also just point, you know, print the print the point estimate along with the confidence interval as, as well in the in the graph. Um, Berber, Berber typed in the chat uh, a suggestion to also look at effects on productivity um, and residue burning. Um, so, Marina, did you have any thoughts on the productivity or uh, productivity? I guess probably there means yield. Uh, maybe it means TFP, which is going to be harder. But uh, and then residue burning. Yeah, productivity for sure. I think. Um... Yeah, as you said, TFP would be harder, but uh, I believe we looked at um, yield at some point, which are the results we can try to bring up again and see what we get, um, because that's definitely also one of the, the goals of the program, at least at the for- former level, to increase their productivity. So. Residual. Well, mechanically, I guess, if the log, if log, log output is going up by 63%, then and log area is going up by 56, then that's seven yeah. uh, right there. So it's mostly, most of the effect is coming from uh, extensifying, I guess. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. So the, the burning, yeah, I think, uh, I don't know, Kai, if you have any thoughts on the data, at least, or if Berber has any suggestions yeah. data sets. <laughs> we had we thoughts on that, that but <laughs> we got, we got lost in what satellite imagery we should be using and mm. and how we can, you know, try and identify crop fires versus other fires. And so we, we, we download the data uh, and it, it was pretty noisy and we had we didn't. Um, we needed some I think we needed some advice on how to <laughs> how to deal with with that. Um, um, uh, we had we had you know literally the Latin long of, of fires and when they happened, um, but we hadn't we hadn't really you know uh, looked at it too systematically. We started to look at it, um, so it's it's on our radar uh, because I, I agree the idea is that like look you start cultivating wheat well if you were cultivating rice beforehand then you might uh, you know you might be burning in order to sow that. So that wheat, and so that's an an important environmental outcome that we need to figure out. But we just, we I think we have some data work to do before we can figure that out. To be quite honest, uh, so anybody who can help us understand that, we're uh, all ears. Uh, 
Um, uh, cropping intensity. Uh, so Marie Charlotte in the chat type has measures cropping intensity. Um, yeah, we can look at that because we have data on all crops, all seasons. So we can look at different, you know, number of crops per year or how, how often land is cultivated or something along those lines. Uh, I think that's an outcome we can uh, more easily wrap our heads around. We do have ambitions on the burning stuff. We're just certainly not quite there yet, right? Yeah. Um, and Niels in the chat types, any food security outcomes? I don't know, Marina, did any food security outcomes? Uh, so I guess that, that would be um, derivates from production, right? It could be some proportion, production is a proportion of something. I don't know, population or something, I guess. <laughs> Perhaps that, maybe there's a survey somewhere. I, I don't know of it, but if somebody knows a survey uh, where we could, uh, you know, post 2012 uh, uh, with uh, more, you know, objective measures of food security. I mean, there's all sorts of different measures of food security out there, but we would need to find a survey that identifies people's districts. It is a fairly large survey uh, to use that as an outcome. Um, we don't have that now, but we could. Um, um, I just don't know of a survey. I mean, ultimately, we, we wanted to look at consumption and different outcomes like that. Those are obviously sort of what people come to, what comes to mind, but th there hasn't been a, a consumption survey for a long time. So that hasn't been uh, possible. Okay, any other comments, questions, suggestions? Uh, Berber types that the issue with MSPs uh, and state procurement effects may dilute. Uh, yes, indeed, that's something we haven't thought about. Okay, last comments. Well, wonderful. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Marina. This has been uh, this has been fun to get back into the rhythm of uh, talking about research. Uh, there's nothing more fun. <laughs> so thanks so much. And uh, um, we're back in business, perhaps uh, uh, next month, Ricardo. Or yes. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Marina. Thank Great you. Talk.